Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. I'm reading first from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Verse 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Rereading it in another version always helps you kind of understand the verse more. I'm reading it now from the NIV. If you have the NIV, I read from the NLT. This is the NIV. Same verse, this is what it says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God add your blessing to the reading of your word. Our title today, Jesus Gets Us. Jesus Gets Us. Maybe you can say, Jesus Gets Me. Amen. Does he really get you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to show you a screenshot of a website. It's from Faithwire. It's a news headline. He Gets Us campaign reintroduces Americans to Jesus. Let me read the caption in that news article. A group of private investors has launched a massive multi-million dollar ad campaign to reintroduce Americans to Jesus. He Gets Us will reach people via TV, Radio, digital ads, billboards, and experiential platforms. Have you seen any of these or heard any of these on the radio? I have, and there's quite a few. With a $100 million budget, it is expected to start conversations among a wide array of people. That's what it says. It's important that you understand what's going on in the world. If you don't watch TV... Check yourself. Why? You don't even watch the news? Maybe you've, how many of you have seen He Gets Us, the ad campaign? Yeah, there's like maybe two or three of you. Um, watch more TV. No, no, no. <laughs> they spent $100 million, this private group. Of course, they're Christian. With the goal of people starting conversations about Jesus. It's important for us to know that someone understands us. They spent $100 million because there was a need. There's a need for people, for Americans in the 21st century, to understand or to know that someone understands us. Someone knows us. Someone feels what we feel and comprehends completely what we are going through. It's important for us that someone gets us. Amen? Hmm. It's a new ad campaign. Go ahead. Search it later, okay? It's later. Go to YouTube. Search He Gets Us ad campaign. He Gets Us ad campaign. And you will be blessed, of course, because it's out in the media. There's also the haters. But it's okay. Go and uh, appreciate what that ad campaign is about. He gets us. We were in Yakima yesterday. Move in, you, Amica. Uh, and we met up on the way there with some serious car trouble. We were in two cars and uh, 
um, Vito and I were in the van with the Amica stuff on the way, and we met up with some car trouble. Not an accident, it was car trouble. And then, what do we do? Vito and I, is like, oh, Vito, there's something happening. We were going like 70. We were going 70, and then suddenly there were 40, 35. And it, oh, dug, 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 something was happening. Uh, <clears throat> what did we do? As, as like, like many of you car enthusiasts, what did we do first? We first turned to YouTube. That's where all the experts go. That's where all the, you ask the experts, that's where they go to. And we searched for someone who had an opinion about that van, someone who had a, Someone who is familiar, someone who is knowledgeable, someone who understands and can sympathize with our exact situation and what they did. So, you know, you type in the make the model of your car and what the trouble was. Hey, there's a lot of people. We found some and we looked at what they did. It was important for me at that time to understand or to know that someone was going through the same thing. That someone was getting us, that someone giving advice and their opinion, what seems like expert opinion, really understands what I'm going through. That's important for us in times of trouble. That's why in crucial times, investors like these will get $100 million to put in. Tell us, he gets us. That's why it's important for families with car troubles. It's important for everyone in any kind of trouble at any time to know someone gets you. Go and tell the person to your left, to your right. Tell them Jesus gets you. That's what our passage will tell us about. And that's our title, Jesus Gets Us. The subtitle, the subtitle in my version if I, you're, you're reading the NIV, the subtitle is Jesus, Our Great High Priest. For that section, it says, Jesus, Our Great High Priest. Look at your version. What this is, what's your subtitle for that section? My subtitle says, Jesus, Our Great High Priest. When you say priest, what comes to your mind? What comes to my mind are clergy people, holy men, or a religious leader. For me, coming from uh, a, a, a Catholic school, an all-boys Catholic school for most of my education, it was one wearing a cassock, a white habit. It's like a dress. It's a, and a clerical collar, one that I will never wear. But, I, you know, I can, brother, babes, we can wear that, right? Uh, I've never seen you wear that. I'm not, I'm not going to wear that. I'm just saying that's what a, a priest would look like. Someone who has that clerical collar, wearing a white habit, and leading mass. Priests are usually highly regarded in society. There was a time they were even feared and some were revered. That's what I understand from a priest. But Jesus was not just a priest. He was called uh, Great high priest. So he was a high priest. Now when you say high priest, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion. Immediately we understand that the book of Hebrews was written for the Jews. Mm. So they understood when it says the high priest, that Jesus is our great high priest. They understand there's a picture painted for them of what a high priest was. Um, this was a mediator, an intermediary, a religious leader of Judaism, one who speaks to us for God and one who speaks to God for us. I'll say that again. A high priest was the representative of the people to God and God's representative for the people, one who speaks to us for God and one who speaks to God for us. A high priest had a high status and high authority in both culture and religion of the Jews. Need you to understand, we're not talking about a clerical caller here, or we're talking about a lot more. 
in terms especially of Judaism. The Aramaic high priest can be translated as this, one who has sorrow with us in our affliction. That's a nice explanation of what a high priest is. <clears throat> but Jesus was not just a priest or a high priest. He was called the great high priest. What's relevant with that? Not only was Jesus the king, proclaimed in the Gospels, proclaimed in the New Testament, not only was he the Messiah fulfilling the promises and the prophecies, but another title of Jesus was the great high priest. Added on was that Greek word mega, megas, great. He was the ultimate high priest. He was the high priest that says, it doesn't get any better than this. If you look for someone who says, who's the boss here? This is the boss, the great high priest. King of kings, Lord of lords, and priest of priests. This is Jesus being presented by the writer of the passage. The priesthood of Jesus is actually superior, and this is what's being shown here. Superior to the priesthood of Aaron. Remember Aaron? Moses was the spokesperson for God. But Aaron was the priest. And Aaron and his line became the priests, right? Later on, we understand um, Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the first person to be named the high priest or the priest in the Old Testament. Both of that, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is shown as superior to the high priest functions of Aaron and to the priestly functions of Melchizedek. Was that significant? One of the major themes of the whole book of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater than all these Old Testament figures and practices. So imagine the Old Testament, all the, all the history, all the culture, all the religion. The writer of Hebrews is saying, here's Jesus, Son of God, superior to all that you understand in your culture and in your religion. That's why it was controversial for the Jews, the book of Hebrews. It says that this great high priest entered the heavens. The picture is the high priest entering the temple or the tabernacle. Remember this? I showed you a picture many, many, many weeks ago of the temple, how the high priest representing the people of God once a year in the Day of Atonement will enter the Holy of Holies. First, he enters the holy place, offers sacrifices, washes himself, enters the holy of holies. So it's like maybe three times that he will publicly take a shower to cleanse himself, make sure that his sins and the sins of the people are cleansed from him so that he can enter the temple, then enter the holy place, then enter the most holy place. A lot of ceremonies the whole day, the day of atonement. But he entered the heavens. If he was not pure enough, he was not clean enough physically, what happens? Right there and then, he's dead. Tradition says that they put bells around his garb and a rope around his ankles. Because when he's moving around doing his sacrifices, the people outside could hear the bells ringing. When he does something wrong, like a misstep, in terms of the procedure and the protocol, he would just drop dead. That's why there's the bells. They could hear, cling, cling, cling. Oh, he's still alive. He's still alive. Our sacrifices are good. He's a good high priest. Then he enters the holy place. It's like, oh, cling, cling, cling. He's still alive. He's still there. Our sacrifices are good. One like, oh, 10 seconds, no sound. Maybe he's praying. 30 seconds, no sound. Then they hear a, a big thud. I think, yep, next high priest. And that's why he's tied in the ankle. They can pull him out. In, I'm not kidding. They can pull him out because he's dead. That's how serious God took this function of the high priest. Now Jesus is the great high priest. Mega superior, the one who entered into the holy place, the holy of holies. He sat down on the right hand of God to intercede for us. 
to do his priestly function. That's why Paul, now in the New Testament, I'm painting that picture for you, it's clear. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Remember that. There is only one intermediary, one mediator. Because of his sacrifice, the Bible says, his sacrifice was once for all. That's how great his sacrifice was. He's the ultimate, the priest of priests. So, Pastor, when, when we do, we come in here. Okay, here we go. Jesus here becomes our singular. He's unique. He's the only one. Sinless, without sin. Sympathetic, he gets us. Savior. The Bible says, just as we are. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Do you see that in verse 15? Singular, sinless, sympathetic Savior. Given that, let me give you a paraphrase. Let me give you a, a good outline of how we can understand Hebrews 4, 14, 15, and 16. Venus paraphrase. Because we have a great high priest, who is Jesus, the sympathetic, sinless Son of God, let us hold firmly to our faith and come boldly, draw near, so that we may, three things, and this will give us our outline for today, receive mercy, find grace, and get timely help. Is this a better way to understand it? Of course, you don't get this until you read all the other versions and read it in many languages. Because we have a great high priest, let us hold firmly, let us come boldly, so we may receive mercy, find grace, and timely help. So what I want to tell you, go ahead, Jesus gets us, so go ahead and hold firmly what you have believed. Don't waver, stay steady, and come boldly. Come confidently into the very throne room of God. Why? What will happen? Number one, we receive mercy. When I say we receive mercy, I'm talking about righteous freedom. There's forgiveness for you. There's compassion for you. There's acceptance for who you are. I remember last week, Brother Brandon, thank you. Brother Brandon was the one that preached to us. The word actually says you can forgive because you have been forgiven. In fact, forgive as you have been forgiven. That's the requirement for people to have mercy on others, is that you have received mercy yourself. How can you have genuine, true Christian compassion if you have also been accepting true and gracious compassion? How can you accept others the way they are unconditionally? Because you also have been accepted unconditionally. You understand that. It is not condemnation. It is not shame. It is acceptance and pardon. Therefore, now there is no condemnation. Romans 8.1 Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We have received pardon and mercy. You cannot be gracious towards others because you have not received it. First, you must receive it. Oh, Pastor, some of us have known, have known forgiveness, have known mercy and compassion, but we have not experienced it. We have not come to the depths of our sin and acknowledged it and appropriated God's grace for it. The sooner you do that, the more you will be gracious towards others. In fact, the people that are judgmental and critical of others, they're also the people that lack understanding of their own sin and their own sinfulness. It is not condemnation. It is not shame. Acceptance and pardon. You know what? When you understand receiving mercy, it's liberating. It's freeing. It's therapeutic to be forgiven. Amen? <laughs> no guilt. 
No guilt, not because you're innocent. No guilt because you have been forgiven. No need to hide who you are. Remember John chapter 8, the story in the Gospel of Jesus, confronted by his enemies, confronted with this adulterous woman. Remember this? Caught in the act. The woman was caught in the act of adultery. They caught her in bed with a married man. Probably set up. Dragged in front of Jesus early in the morning. Jesus, what you say. What did Jesus say to the woman? Woman, I'm not here to condemn you. Leave your life of sin and be free. Woman, I'm not here to condemn you. Leave your life of sin and be free. A declaration of righteous freedom. A word of acceptance and forgiveness. That woman was given a second chance. This is what Jesus is about. You come to Jesus, you hold firmly to what we have believed of Jesus, and you come boldly because He knows you. He understands you. It's not the freedom. This is some people are thinking, oh, freedom, then I'll do what I want. That's not freedom. Freedom, people think, well, if I'm free, then I'll do what I want. That's actually slavery. That's slavery to your ego, slavery to your pride, slavery to sin. So it's either you're a slave to sin or a slave to God. True freedom is slavery to God. Wow, Pastor, that's deep. True freedom is freedom to do what I was designed to do, what I was created to do, what God has purposed me to do. If you are free to do what you are created to do, then you are truly free. But if you do what your sinful nature tells you to do, then you are a slave to sin and pride and selfishness. Jesus gives you freedom, righteous freedom. Amen? What do I say then? Jesus gets you. And he forgives you. Now you can be free. You can be free. Some of us are trapped. There's like mental or spiritual cages in our minds, in our spirits, in our hearts. Jesus gets you. And he's opened that door, that cage. He forgives you. Come to him and be free. Number two, Jesus, our high priest, when we come to him, we find grace. When you find grace, something develops into you. Humble boldness. Is that possible, Pastor? That's like a contradiction of terms. Humble boldness. It is what it is. <clears throat> There's no fear in the presence of God. You can come full of confidence, not in yourself, not in what you have accomplished, not in your own goodness and religiosity. Have you tried that? Coming to God? Coming to God in front of Him and, and offering because of your own righteousness? self-righteousness. Jesus said, no, not that. You come in grace. No fear, full of confidence, not in ourselves, but in God's provisions for you. Not worrying that His holiness will burn you up, like that high priest comes into the tent. Remember the holiness of God? They were just helping the ark was going to fall. Some good intentioned people, but it was not following holiness protocols. They touched that ark Oh, right there and then, dead. Remember in the New Testament how God was so holy and wanting to instill holiness, there's people that lied to the apostles, lied to the church regarding, I think their names were, what's, it, what's their name? I forgot their names. The couple, pow, right there and right then, dead. Ananias and... Safira, husband and wife, lying to the Lord. Peter says, why did you do that? Pow! Dead, right there and then. This is a scary God when it comes to holiness. Tell you what, this is the same God. But we can hold firmly to what we believe of Jesus. We can come boldly into his presence, not burning up because 
we find grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. didn't pay for it. We didn't clean ourselves enough because there's no way that you can do that on your own. The boldness to not worry and enter His presence. Remember Queen Esther in the Old Testament. How she needed boldness to enter the king's presence. Because you can be killed if you enter the king's presence without being summoned. And it's like, we're talking about the queen. And she says, I, I don't know if I can do that, but, you know, pray for me. If I die, I die. And with boldness, she entered confidently and the miraculous happened. That's the boldness. It's like that. It's like a child entering his or her dad's office or workplace. It's like a, a child entering without regard for protocol or appointments or procedure. Just holding on to his or her relationship with his or her father regardless of whether he's the president or the king or the CEO just holding firmly to their relationship a relationship of grace so you can come boldly but because of grace it's unfettered access with Jesus you feel at home that's why when your your guests come Oh yeah, what do you say? Oi, mi casa, su casa. My house is your house. Feel at home. Do you tell that to your guests? Feel at home. Some of you regret saying that, right? But when you say that, you're telling them, hey, whatever you do in your house, do it here. This is your house. Feel at home. <laughs> Feel at home or remove your slippers. Right there. Or remove your shoes. Right there. Feel at home. Don't touch that. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. That's the bathroom. Wash your hands well. Sanitize. Feel at home. <laughs> yeah. But it's unfettered access. You have access to God because of grace. Unfiltered openness. These words that I have to use the thesaurus for. Unfiltered openness. It tells God, when I come, I will come just as I, you don't need to pretend. Just as you are. You know, you go to a masquerade party. Have you been to a ball, masquerade ball, where, where, where you, you need to have a mask to come in, like in the Phantom of the Opera kind of thing? It's so formal. It's so pretentious. Everyone comes in with a mask. And I'm not even talking about a, a, a mask, like a, like a COVID mask. I'm talking about like a costume to cover who they really are. With God and God's presence, because you find grace, just come as you are. And we hope and we pray that this place becomes a, a place of grace. That you can come the way you are. You don't need to pretend. Are you pretending right now as to who you are? Some of you might be. We want you to know you can experience unfettered access and unfiltered openness in the presence of God. Come the way you are. Oh, Pastor, if you knew who I really was, I don't know if I will be welcome. You don't know how I really am, but I still try. You know why? Because of God's grace. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to, we're going to welcome you and accept you and love you and grow with you because we're like you. And with grace that we have found, it's an equal opportunity for giver, equal opportunity acceptance. I have 10 sins, you have 99. You're both welcome because it's by grace. You didn't earn it. That's why I like camp. How many of you have been to camp? Youth camp, family camp, any kind of camp. Why do you like camp? You, in camp, you get to see who people really are early in the morning, before breakfast, before that first cup of coffee, right out of the tent. You see who they really are without makeup, without a hairdo, without you know ironing their clothes. Some of them in their pajamas. Oh, wow. It paints a picture in your head, right? Some of you were closer to one another. You know why? Because we saw each other for the way we really are. I saw your, the holes in your pajama. There are a few people here. They know me. They, it's, it's holes. In, this is what I wrote here. I don't know why I wrote. Oh, yeah. Okay. Holes in my shirt, pajama, straight out of bed look. And some of you have seen me like this. Holes in my shirt, pajama, straight out of the bed look. 
good morning. Many times I've come out of my room, like I, I'm, I'm on my way to coffee still. And, Hi, good morning. <laughs> it's people in my house that, you know, they welcome. Of course you're welcome. I'm just saying. It's unrestricted access. It's my house is your house. <laughs> That's how it is with God's presence. Come the way you are. Feel at home. Tell that to your neighbor. Feel at home. Don't pretend. You did not earn this access and I have not either. It was given to us by grace. By grace. What's grace? You can confidently claim grace by acknowledging that you are not entitled to it. So I can boast about grace. I can boast about grace because I didn't, I didn't pay for it. I didn't earn it. It was just given to me. And you know what? You have access to it too. That's welcoming. That's love. That's finding grace. That's the boldness that you have, but at the same time being humble and say, Hallelujah, that we're in God's presence, but none of us are here because we deserve it. That's humble boldness. It is a gift, a free gift. It is grace. Because it is grace, it is simply accepted. You don't, you find it. You don't, you don't, um, you don't earn it. You don't work for it. You find it, you uncover it, you discover it. You simply and humbly accept it. So I say, Jesus gets you just the way you are so you can be real. No pretensions, no trying to please one another because we're all here by grace. Let's try to please the one who was gracious. Jesus, our great high priest. The last is timely help. What I mean by that, it is, it is accessible assurance. You can call on him. I put that there already before I forget. Jesus gets you anytime, anywhere. Pray. Call upon him. I'm encouraging you. Pray. Even in the urgent, emergent times. Go ahead. It's like 911. You can call anytime, anywhere. Or uh, some of you don't know this. 988. Have you tried calling 988? 988 is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. If there's someone, and this is like a free advertisement, if some of you know someone that is on the verge of, or maybe thinking about it, if they've talked about it, tell them, reach out to someone. It's, there, there, it's a non-judgmental, no, it's a free call, 988. Tell them, if you're really struggling with thoughts of suicide, the National Suicide Prevention Line, don't dial 911. They will also refer you to 988. It is help that is always accessible. You've heard it said, it's only a prayer away. It's only a prayer away. It could be as simple as safety on your road trip or favor in terms of parking space. Have you? Do you do that? It could be as trivial as that. Or a little more serious, guidance for, say, a board exam. Guidance in terms of what career or college to go into. Even into major things like comfort for the terminally ill. Pain of broken relationships. Immediate intervention for a family crisis. Or, or you know, like deciding who to marry. Mm, big things. But it's the assurance that you know what? He gets you. 24-7, 365. 24 hours in a day, 7 days a week, 365 and one-fourth days in a year, He gets you. He knows you. He understands you, sympathizes with you, empathizes with you, yet without sin. He has the right to give you and dispense the grace of God. We are saved by His grace. Jesus, our high priest. Military folks understand this. They say, I've got your six. What does that mean? He's got your back. Twelve, three, nine, six. He's got your back. Jesus got you all over. Jesus gets you 24, 7, 365. That's why the Bible says, God is our refuge. God is our strength. 
an ever-present help in times of trouble. The whisper of a prayer of someone that texted you, there's an emergency here, there's an emergency there, and you're helpless against it. But you know what? You can do something. You can hold firmly to what you believe. You can come boldly into His grace. Just say that prayer. He hears. He understands. He is our great high priest. Amen? You know, because of our interconnected world, not only are we updated on what's going on with friends and family from all over the world and from every time zone in the world. And that's a good thing. We're updated on everything, anywhere, anytime. We are also updated and informed of every emergency and every urgent prayer request from everywhere, from every time zone, every time. What, do, what does a pastor do? From halfway around the world, you receive a, 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 an emergency. I'm helpless here. I can't do anything. I don't have the resources to fly over, lay my hands on someone, or, 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 or try to really help physically. But you know what? I have a great high priest. I can call upon him. He's an ever-present help. I can call on him. It is accessible assurance that help is on the way. It's not an empty promise. It is the promise of God's word as Jesus being our great high priest. Amen? Jesus gets you anytime, anywhere, call upon him. Amen? Those are the slides. Get us, hold firmly, come boldly, receive mercy, find grace, and timely help. Let's all stand up and pray.